So, hi everyone. Uh, it's Friday morning in Melbourne, but Thursday night in Ouro Preto. So, good morning, Peter. Good night, Ernesto, Desiderio, and uh, everyone else following us on this session. It is a great honor for me to open this session with these three very important philosophers. But there is no fair way to present them without taking too much of the precious time we have with them. So let me just try to say the least. Peter Singer is professor of bioethics at Princeton University and founder of the nonprofit organization The Life You Can Save. Professor Singer wrote legendary books and articles and papers on ethics. His books include Animal Liberation and Clinical Ethics. What? Okay, just keep going. Professor Singer wrote legendary books. And His books include Animal Liberation, Practical Ethics, and The Most Good You Can Do. In the last few months, Professor Singer wrote great articles about pandemic ethics on topics like human challenge trials, lockdowns, triage, and wet markets. Now, Ernesto Perini is professor of philosophy at Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais. Professor Perini has many important papers in medieval philosophy, philosophy of language, ontology, and epistemology. More recently, he has been working on themes like fake news, science, denialism, and post-truth. Desiderio Muxo is professor of philosophy at the Universidade Federal de Ouro Preto. Professor Muxo wrote important papers and articles, books, and translations in many different areas of philosophy, like logic, metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. More recently, Professor Muxo wrote articles on epistemic responsibility. As you can see, they all have been published on vivid topics of philosophy that can be strictly related to the new crisis caused by COVID-19 pandemics. This is why we invited these three amazing philosophers for this conversation about the philosophical unfoldings of COVID-19 pandemics. Hope everyone enjoyed this conversation. Since they work with different, even if very closely related topics, I suggest them to give each an introductory speech about what they have been thinking about the aforementioned topics. I invite everyone to write them questions through the chat so I can read for them in a second moment. Thanks a lot for accepting our invitation, professors. And uh, Professor Singer, will you give us the honor to be the first one? Thank you. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to, to join you and to speak about these important issues uh, at your conference. Uh, there are, of course, many different issues that are raised by uh, the pandemic, and I'm only going to be able to touch on some of them during this short 15-minute talk. Uh, I will start with one of the questions that was perhaps one of the first to emerge when the pandemic uh, started to really affect a large number of people in uh, northern Italy. Uh, and the situation there was that uh, there were many people who became ill all at once. They, uh, those who were more seriously affected needed to uh, the, the pl a place in an intensive care unit that they needed to be on a ventilator. Uh, because they were starting to have breathing difficulties, and that was one of the major causes of death. But the uh, intensive care units rapidly became full with people. So the question arose, uh, who should we accept? The, the standard medical ethical principle in these situations is first come, first served. If you arrive at the emergency room and you need an intensive care bed, you will get one. And if you, that was the last bed that you took and the next person arrives, they can't displace you. Uh, of course, you might search for another bed somewhere else around the region, but uh, if you can't, that's just unfortunate for the person who arrived afterwards. But obviously, this is not an ideal situation because we can 
have patients with different chances of survival. We can also have patients who may need a respirator uh, only for a short time and others who may need it for a long time. So if you just take first come, first served, you might find that you have accepted a patient who has, in any case, very little chance of survival, perhaps because in the case of COVID-19, uh, they're extremely elderly, maybe 90 plus, or if they have a pre-existing health condition that uh, is going to reduce their chances, um, then they're not less likely to survive. But also, um, they may be in the intensive care unit needing the, the respirator for uh, weeks or a month or more, whereas other younger patients may just need it to get past the present emergency and then uh, may be able to be released to a normal hospital bed rather than an intensive care unit. So the result of first come, first served would be that more people would die. Um, you would save fewer people than if you allocated them on the basis of a, a principle of triage. Um, those who need it most and who need the resource for the shorter time would be the ones to be given priority. Um, and to their credit, uh, an Italian medical body recommended that that should happen. Uh, it recommended that generally patients over 70 should have lower preference than patients under. That's a pretty arbitrary cutoff line because, of course, you might have some patients who are 75 but in very good health and other patients who are 65 but have other underlying health conditions that mean their chances are, are less good. So you do need some judgment um, and that does put pressure on the person in charge of admissions to the intensive care unit. But I think it's, it's still uh, the right thing to do. I think this is a situation in which we should be trying to maximize the number of lives that we save and to use the scarce resources in that way. So, um, so that's one uh, ethical issue, uh, one that in fact has been discussed by bioethicists for a long time before the pandemic, um, but uh, needs to be applied in this situation. A second important question arises in research ethics. Um, we are currently trying to find an effective vaccine against COVID-19. And we have been doing that for some months now. Uh, it's important because at, mo at the moment, thousands of people are dying every day worldwide because of the disease. So every day, that we can get a vaccine sooner every day we save in terms of the uh, effort to develop and bring to market an effective vaccine is going to save thousands of lives. That's therefore a very important thing to do. How can we save some days in bringing this to market? Well, um, the normal method of trialing a vaccine candidate, you assume that you have something that could be uh, a safe and effective vaccine. Uh, but before you can mass produce it and uh, give it to the general public, you need to make sure that it is both safe and effective. And the normal way of doing that is to give it to a large number of people who are going to be exposed to the virus in the course of their normal lives. They might be healthcare workers, for example, who will be at higher risk than other people. And you also um, give a placebo uh, to a similar number or to a number of people in a similar situation. And then uh, after some time, but it may take some months, uh, you compare the number of people who got the vaccine uh, with the number of, with the people who got the placebo, and you see whether fewer of those who got the vaccine um, have actually got the infection or have become ill with the infection. Uh, and uh, whether it's there are any other complications that suggest it's not safe for them. But that can take a long time because the, if the rate of infection is fairly low and naturally all healthcare workers try to avoid getting infected, then uh, it's going to be a long time before you get sufficient cases of infections in both the uh, group that received the vaccine and the control group to really get statistically significant results. But there's a way of speeding this up very dramatically, and that is to 
take a group of people, um, give them again the vaccine and the placebo, and then deliberately infect them with the uh, with uh, the disease, with the virus. Um, and then you can see within a matter of uh, a week or two who has been protected by the virus and by the vaccine and who has not been protected. Now, at this stage, you might be saying, hey, you can't do that. That's that's like what the Nazis did to use concentration camp prisoners for their horrendous experiments. But of course, I'm not talking about using prisoners or anything like that. I'm talking about using informed consenting volunteers who know about the risks that they're taking, but have nevertheless chosen to volunteer to be infected with the virus under those conditions, precisely because they want to do something to save lives. They want to be part of the effort to bring the vaccine to market sooner and therefore save thousands of lives. You might then think, well, but are there really people who would do that, um, who would be so altruistic? And the answer to that question, I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to tell you, is yes, there are altruists out there. Uh, there is a website called One Day Sooner, um, named after the desire to bring the vaccine to market one day sooner, that has, uh, last time I checked, about 37,000 people who have signed up to volunteer for these kinds of trials, which are known as human challenge trials, because you challenge the humans with the virus. So we do have people willing to volunteer in, in a, many different countries uh, willing to do this. And uh, although when I first started writing about this, no uh, research uh, laboratory or company had actually scheduled human challenge trials, that's uh, no longer the case. Um, the uh, uh, laboratory in, in Oxford, uh, based at uh, Oxford University, uh, has, and I think at Imperial College London, has now um, uh, agreed to start using uh, volunteers in the United Kingdom, uh, and those trials should begin in January. So um, this is, again, uh, a way in which the pandemic challenges conventional research ethics, uh, and I think justifiably so, um, justifiably so in terms of uh, although there is a risk that people are running, they're volunteers. If we don't do these, trial, these trials, other people are going to run this risk, a much larger number of people. Uh, and they're not volunteers. They have no choice if they're health workers and they want to keep their positions. They have no choice but to run that risk. And in fact, the general public obviously runs a risk too. School teachers run a risk. Everybody is running a risk. So better, I think, for fewer people to run it and better also for those who have chosen to volunteer to do it than uh, other people who have no choice. So that seems to me to be the, the second important uh, question. Um, there, are, there are other issues specific to uh, COVID-19. Uh, questions have been raised about contact tracing, uh, about developing apps that will show who has been in contact with who, uh, uh, people having apps on their phone uh, that will record when they're close to somebody else. And then if they get infected, you can look at the records. Uh, there have been ethical concerns about that relating to privacy. But um, uh, again, I think probably in this emergency situation, we should be prepared to sacrifice some privacy in order to save lives. Uh, Obviously, we want to guard against abuse of uh, that information, but that's possible. We can have systems where, in fact, nobody really has uh, access to everybody else's movements, um, but nevertheless, uh, the, the information is there, and when it's needed, it can be pulled up. So um, uh, this is somewhat more technical question than I'm uh, able to go into fully. But I, again, I think we should be open to those changes to our normal concerns about privacy in order to maximize the efficiency of contact tracing um, to uh, stop the virus. Uh, a fourth important issue is the question of lockdowns, which um, many countries are going into. Uh, I'm in Melbourne, where we have been through 111 days of very strict lockdown. We're just coming out of it now because at the start of this lockdown, 
we had, this is a city of about 5 million people, had uh, 700 new cases in one day. Um, the, go the state government instituted a lockdown, which uh, meant that uh, nobody was supposed to go more than five kilometers from their home. There was a curfew. Nobody was supposed to be out between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. You could only go out for an hour to exercise. You couldn't have visitors into your home other than your immediate family. You were not to go to work unless your work was essential and you could not work from home. Schools were closed. Uh, restaurants, all of those things, of course, were closed. So it was a very strict lockdown and a lot of people found it somewhat frustrating, but it's worked. Uh, for the last four, four or five days, we have had no new cases at all in Victoria. And in fact, most of uh, the rest of Australia also has had no new cases in the last few days. So lockdowns work in terms of saving the lives of people who would otherwise die from the virus. Um, but there is a significant cost. There is an economic cost, uh, even with government uh, aid. Um, people lost income. Uh, whole areas of business obviously had to close. Restaurants, theatres, cinemas. Uh, sporting events had to take place without crowds. Um, it, there was a big cost, and, and that's a human cost as well, not just an economic cost. Uh, mental health can suffer when people are unemployed and, and locked up at home. Um, the education of children obviously suffered when they couldn't go to school, and particularly disadvantaged children may not have been able to learn well online uh, or not have had the facilities to do that. Um, and uh, so, and there are also health costs because um, people weren't going to get to standard medical checkups. So perhaps because of a lack of routine screening, let's say for skin cancer, which is a big issue in Australia, there may be more people who get skin cancer in future years. We don't know how many that will be, but there will be some costs. Uh, state revenue will fall because of the economic recession. Will that mean that they can't afford to hire so many doctors and nurses in in, in state-run hospitals? Uh, so it's very difficult to compare these costs. And that's something which I think needs more work. How are we going to assess the costs of lockdowns? How are we going to judge the costs and benefits of lockdowns? And in a sense, we're asking, how much is a human life worth? And in asking that very difficult question, again, we need to say, and should we say how much is a life worth or how much is a year of life worth? Is it relevant that COVID mainly kills people who are of an advanced age and therefore have fewer years to live than say skin cancer, which can kill people at quite an early age? So there are a lot of interesting calculations to be done and they're not just factual calculations, they require evaluation of the different costs of benefits. And that's something that again, I think philosophers have a role to play in discussing how we should compare those costs and benefits. The final thing I wanna say, and I don't wanna go over my time, is that this pandemic arose because of humans consumption of non-human animals, uh, probably from the wet markets of Wuhan and the consumption of exotic animals like pangolins, which appear to have been infected with the virus, um, possibly from bats as well. Um, now, you might say, well, those are very exotic animals, and uh, if there's a risk, then we can stop eating those particular animals. And obviously, that is one thing that we should do. Uh, it's in any case uh, harmful to biodiversity to be killing these wild animals for food. It's also very cruel because they were caged and sold alive. Um, they must have been terrified in those conditions, and then they were not humanely killed either. But uh, we need to think more broadly than that. Uh, the previous pandemic, the swine flu pandemic of 2009, which also killed hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, uh, began because of uh, intensive farming, uh, an intensive pig farm, uh, probably in North Carolina in the United States, possibly in Mexico. Uh, and scientists recognized that these very large intensive farms where tens of thousands of animals are housed in single sheds, breathing the same air, uh, stressed because of the crowding with weakened immune systems. Uh, that's an ideal environment for breeding new viruses. And uh, if we really want to be serious about minimizing the risk of pandemics, I think we need to rethink uh, large-scale animal consumption, which is provided from these 
factory farms. Uh, I have in any case been criticizing factory farming for the last uh, 45 years since I wrote my book Animal Liberation in 1975 because of the cruelty to animals that uh, they inflict. And I think that's sufficient reason. Now we also know that climate change is affected by raising animals and that that's another reason to reduce the consumption of animals. Uh, the pandemic adds a third powerful reason to it and I hope that many people will rethink their consumption of animals for that reason as well as climate change and concern for the interests of animals. And at that point I'll stop. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Singer. Oh, it's a great talk. And uh, now I invite Professor Ernesto. And uh, go ahead, Ernesto. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, um, thank you for the invitation. I'm going to share a screen with a, here it is. Uh, I'm going to talk about, about science denialism and the, and the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Okay, so uh, I think the pandemic uh, shows a uh, deep-rooted conflict in, in the way knowledge is spread in society. And the conflict is that the pandemic increases the value of knowledge and it's science to understand what's happening, to face the challenges it presents and project the future. But it also increases social tensions that fools science den denialism. And this conflict has deep roots in the working of knowledge and belief I think we have to understand how how the, the social nature of belief and the social nature of knowledge to understand uh, the nature of the conflict that the pandemic uh, throw us in. Uh, I start talking about knowledge and trust. Uh, epistemic normativity enjoys us to adjust our beliefs to the available evidence. For any subject about which one is not an expert, uh, the evidential basis cannot be assessed directly and has, one has to defer to experts. This is true for its broad acceptance in society, in society but, but also for the very production of knowledge that is uh, collaborative and asymmetric, uh, that the scientists also work in collaboration and also have a symmetric dependence on others. And, uh, um, we cannot see your slide yet. You can't see? No. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm going to start. Um, let me try again. Share screen. Is that okay now? Uh, it's a okay. I can see now. So, um, no, not, not. <laughs> no, 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 okay, so I have to, yeah, maybe okay. you need to use this way, because when you, try to... okay, that, that, that's yeah. okay, that's okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about the conflict that arises with uh, the pandemic, that is the conflict that is at the, at the root of science denialism. And this conflict has a deep uh, roots in, in human culture, and the nature of human culture. Um, uh, as I start, the pandemic increases the value of knowledge and of science. We need science to understand what's happening, to face the, fa the, the challenge that it presents and to project the future. But the pandemic also increases social tensions that force science denial denialism. And that's what you have to understand to see that, to, to see why pandemic at the same time uh, increases the, the trust in science, but increases also science denialism at the same time, increases a conflict, it reinforces a conflict. Uh, to start to, to know how, why this is so, we we'll talk about knowledge and trust. Uh, but the first remark is that epistemic normativity enjoys us to adjust our beliefs to, uh, to the available evidence. And for any subject about which one is not an expert, that means deferring to experts. And the result is that epistemic normativity uh, enjoys us to defer to experts for pretty much any subject. This is true both for the broad acceptance of science in a, in a society, and, and this is also true for the production of knowledge. The scientists also work in collaboration in, in asymmetric ways. 
And this is a deep rooted com conflict in human culture. A society always knows more than each of it than what each of its each its members knows. And the, the result is that for each member of a society of a given group, it has to trust on more knowledgeable others on many subjects. And size science only inc increases this dependence. The group as a whole knows much more. But also, uh, the resulting knowledge is much more uh, opaque to, to almost anyone who is not an expert. So we have to trust more when we have uh, contents that we cannot fully grasp. Uh, discussions about epistemic trust usually focus on testimony and the question of who to trust. Uh, this, this may be the case for many situations in, and may be the case that we trust uh, an expert. But this is not generally true for, for what you know about scientific results. We do not trust the World Health Organization, for instance, because you trust uh, a person or an expert. You trust an institution. <coughs> More precisely, <coughs> we trust uh, an institution that, re that represents a certain sort of knowledge. And moreover, we cannot keep track of <coughs> what research institutes or universities are say. As, as some have suggested that that's what you do for persons for 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 personal trust you can think that you can keep trust and keep track of what someone say and then decide whether to trust or not we cannot do that for for science knowledge it's for a start uh, its contents are highly opaque and we do trust uh, what comes from certain institutions that embody this kind of knowledge so it is epistemic rational to trust a certain kind of exports associated with certain kinds of institutions, even when they do not understand fully or at all what they say, and to use the consensus of exports as a proxy for epistemic reasons. And even when there's no consensus, we still depend on exports. So this is important. Even when there is uncertainty, that doesn't mean that everyone becomes an, an expert on a certain subject. We still depend on exports, even when they have no consensus about what to say on a given subject, when there are doubts. So while, bo while both the opacity and the personal nature of scientific knowledge may not be comfortable for each member of a, of a society, there is a great value that comes with it. And it is the scientific knowledge itself. So uh, as, as the importance of scientific knowledge in increases, so does the value of scientific institutions and how much we depend on them. And this is the case of the pandemic. However, the pandemic put a strain on this sort of trust for two reasons. Uh, uh, for a start, the, the uncertainties about, about the pandemic, about the nature of the virus and its, uh, its, uh, of the disease and the, the rate of infections and what to do. So there are many uncertainties. But I, as I have uh, said, that doesn't change the fact that we still need experts to assess the different evidence we have, we have for each of these claims, of, for each claim concerning each, of the, each one of those topics. Moreover, there is the costs of facing the pandemic. They are very high, uh, as Professor Singh, Singh has said. And, and also this put a strain on, on this trust because you have to trust on, on exports uh, to make choices that are very costly to every one of us. And even to understand what we gain in each choice, for instance, that the rate of infection is lowering, we still, we still depend on exports and also in this, in, on, the, on the media to report what the experts say. And, uh, uh, and finally, uh, the very capacity of scientific knowledge becomes more salient for, uh, for a subject that, uh, that uh, costs so much in our lives. The fact that you do not fully understand uh, or even do not understand at all why you are facing such a, such a harsh, harsh situation, both with the lockdown, but also with the, 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 the pandemic itself. So, uh, this put a strain on trust, but it's not all. Uh, besides those epistemic issues, trust also have a non-epistemic face. And that's why I have to understand the double nature of beliefs. So the beliefs have uh, uh, an epistemic nature, of course. That's why the beliefs are sensitive to epistemic reasons. That's why, as Bernard Williams has argued, we cannot decide to believe. We cannot believe what we want. But that doesn't mean that we follow the epistemic normativity uh, fully 
or even that we follow stamp normativity it just means that whenever we depart from stamp normativity we still have to take uh, an epistemic form to justify our beliefs but why should one why would one depart from stamp normativity well there are three at least three kinds of reasons but the first reason is a, is a proper cognitive reason that has to do with cognitive biases and the cognitive cognitive bias is one one replaces uh, uh, a difficult question uh, by an easier question that one can answer and that works in some contexts but not in, um, but cannot be generalized so this is uh, the, the source of cognitive bias that is one reason for us to uh, to departure from epistemic reasons cognitive dissonance is another reason for not follow epistemic reasons that is when there is a conflict between uh, uh, all the things that we believe or our values and what science or or, or, or simply what uh, someone else s says so we, ha we try to solve this cognitive dissonance and when, one way to solve it is to choose our values from against uh, knowledge and this is a way also to to avoid uh, what the, the, to go where stem prisons lead us and finally beliefs function also as identity markers that is beliefs uh, a belief is a way to indicate that one belongs to a group and this connects with the, the cognitive dissonance here's a quote from uh, uh, Dan Cahan and he says that uh, I'm going to read it individual well-being is intric intricately bound up with group membership which supplies individuals not only with material benefits but a range of critical non-material ones including opportunities to acquire status and self-esteem challenges to common health Group beliefs can undermine a person's well-being either by threatening to drive a wedge between the persons, the person and other group members, by interfering with important practices within the group, or by impugning the social competence and thus the esteem conferring capacity of a group generally. Accordingly, as a means to of identity self-defense, individuals appraise information in a manner that addresses beliefs associated with belonging to particular groups. So this is way in which uh, accepting a belief that comes from uh, a group that is not one's own group may affect individual self-esteem individual well-being so a belief as identity marker but also the cognitive dissonance of say some scientific results uh on on on, on the person's well-being i'm going to keep the next slide so and why is it why this is so uh, the reason that beliefs work as a uh, uh, a identity markers is, is that large-scale coordination requires identification of groups and who belongs where uh, for which schools are required so one crucial who for belonging to a group is the display of beliefs so and beliefs themselves being sent are sensitive to co these these coordination functions the display of beliefs are sensitive to coordination functions and so are beliefs that are selected with the behavior patterns they produce that includes they display uh, that i believe that that and that so belie beliefs are also sensitive to coordination values they are not only sensitive to epistemic values uh, the acceptance or not of a theory, theory of evolution for instance may be a strong identity marker there's no epistemic reason not to accept it but it may be it may be easier to individuals to accept creationism or, or its pseudo scientific counterpart the intelligent design theory so from an individual point of view it may be more rational to not accept the theory of evolution uh, because uh, this will work as an identity marker uh, but a society that decides to give equal weight to evolutionary theory or to intelligent design creationism theories uh, does not have the concept of resources to deal with the challenges presented by evolving strains of viruses and bacteria nor any other challenge involving biological knowledge including of course the pandemic so where's the conflict the conflict more than the conflict lies in those two functions of beliefs more than ever we need science and the balance seems to be shifting towards a more widespread acceptance of science but that also means that they need more trust in institutions embodying scientific knowledge again more trust in, in, in science when for very opaque con uh, uh, contents uh, full of uncertainties and uh, demanding us a high price to pay the conflict lies in the fact that epistemic normativity also leads to group coordination via difference to experts or to science however epistemic reasons may enjoy one to accept what is said by a group to which one does not belong 
uh, with which one does not ident identify in saying things that against one, one's values. So the conflict lies in the fact that also epistemic normativity leads to a sort of coordination. Uh, in order to accept what science sa says, we have to put the coordination function of beliefs in brackets, or accept another sort of coordination that is epistemic difference, even with uncertainties. That's why science denialism also in so pandemic uh, increase pandemic has increased the social tension, and one response to it is the boosting of identitary values. We can think, for instance, of increasing the increase of pogroms during the plague in the Middle Ages, and a consequence is the reinforcement of the coordination function of beliefs against the production of knowledge when we need it most. So, uh, at the same time that we need science more than ever, pandemics, all, uh, pandemics in general also make more difficult to build trusting relations in society, in a society. That's why science denialism also increases with the pandemic along the lines of those playing the identity card against scientific knowledge. That's what the far right was already doing worldwide before the pandemic, and that's why it's so dangerous. That the far right not only, but mainly. Uh, but the same thing happens with uh, global climate warming, climate change, which is something very opaque that I mean, huge efforts based on scientific expertise that we have to trust, that, that, that is trust institutions embodying this expertise. This also has been the object of the attack of the war right for a long time with harsh consequences for life on Earth. Uh, science denialism is reinforced by the high price everyone has to play in these dire circumstances with huge amount of uncertainty. It is already not easy to understand that uncertainties do not change the evidential requirements for knowledge, in particular when there is so much at stake but the existence of polit political actor that chooses coordination values against the institutions that produce knowledge that is that chooses ignorance makes everything harder. Uh, what's at stake is the survival of our species. Um, so that's it, I'm going to stop. Thanks Ernesto, great talk. Uh, now I invite Professor Desiderio to you, you're welcome. You should unmute yourself. Uh, how do I do that? Are you hearing now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so, so uh, well, Clifford uh, wrote famously uh, that it is wrong always uh, everywhere and for anyone to believe anything upon uh, insufficient evidence. Uh, this is a very uh, well uh, known and quoted uh, uh, phrase. And uh, uh, the thing here is that he was a professor of mathematics at uh, University College London and uh, introduced actually what is now known as Clifford algebra. So this one, this uh, leads one to believe that uh, in, in this uh, famous passage, he did not have in mind a, uh, a restricted sense of uh, evidence. For in that restricted sense, uh, we have no evidence for, say, mathematical truth. We have, uh, well, proofs instead, right? And uh, uh, it, would it, it would be quite odd to suggest that uh, uh, what Clifford intended to say was that it is wrong always, everywhere, and for anyone to believe in mathematical truth. Thus, I will assume he had a, a generous, broad conception of evidence in mind uh, that would be best phrased perhaps as anything that appropriately counts in favor of the issue at hand. Thus, mathematical proofs do count as well as empirical observations and uh, scientific experiments. So it seems fair to me to say that Clifford had in mind something like appropriate justification or as uh, Ernesto Perini talked here about uh, epistemic reasons. Now, what constitutes appropriate justification is a very difficult uh, epistemological issue. And uh, although I do not have the time to talk at length about it, I have to highlight two very serious and related difficulties for reasons that I hope will become then uh, clear in a, in a second. The first difficulty is the concept uh, uh, of appropriate justification itself 
uh, or evidence, if you want to use uh, Clifford's phrase, uh, uh, the first difficulty is that there is always several conflicting pieces of evidence for and against any issue at all. So that's a difficult because we have to sift through through the evidence and try to uh, measure and judge and see where uh, uh, things fall to one side or the other or to the other. Now the second issue is that uh, by nature human beings seem to be well we might call them uh, masters of rational rationalization uh, in the sense that uh, I mean if if you take seriously some of the most troubling results of cognitive psychology in the last 50 years or so. Uh, that means that human beings are very good at rationalizing things. And I, I'm using the word rationalization, not, of course, in the positive sense, but rather in the negative one. This is the art of using deceptive reasons intended to give an air of uh, epistemic responsibility to what is indeed just uh, self-interest or uh, epistemic uh, insouciance, to use uh, Kassam's term. Now, these two difficulties feed on each other, so to speak, because if I am epistemically irresponsible or wicked, there is always a further piece of evidence that I can use to discredit my op opponents and to promote my favorite lie. And the same is true when I am the one I am lying to. So uh, this is all, all, all also works in that way. Now, Clifford was perhaps not aware of these uh, difficulties, or at least that is not uh, apparent from his text. However, he was quite clear about a further aspect of human epistemology that Professor Perini already uh, spoke about, that knowledge is, for the most part, social. What this means is that, apart from cases of very superficial here and now knowledge, almost all knowledge results from the cooperation of several agents, sometimes across centuries, and of course across uh, countries. What Clifford saw quite clearly is that accepting the sort of carefree attitude towards evidence and belief that William James uh, defended, and indeed the humanity in general for the, most of the time, Doing that is a formidable obstacle to the discovery of truth. Now, I want to put aside philosophical niceties here because it seems that uh, a plausible and a charitable interpretation of Clifford's point is not the radical philosophical thesis that every case of epistemic insouciance is in itself a case of moral wrongness. We can easily imagine cases where a given epistemic failure does not affect other morally relevant agents and is not therefore by itself a moral failure. I would rather interpret Clifford as someone that believes that in general, as a matter of public policy, so to speak, epistemic insouciance should be considered morally wrong simply because it tends to negatively affect morally relevant agents, even if there are rare cases where the epistemic vice remains private and does not actually affect negatively any morally relevant agent. So the point is that uh, those cases are indeed rare and our society should not tolerate epistemic insouciance simply because it tends to make our lives worse or the lives of uh, other morally uh, relevant agents. Allowing epistemic insouciance uh, in some uh, perfectly private and consequence-free situations makes it harder to demand epistemic responsibility in public life. And I think this is one of Clifford's point. Now, why are these considerations relevant to the current situation? Well, because so far 1.23 million people died from the current COVID-19 virus. Most of them as a direct result of epistemic, epistemic irresponsibility of public officials, members of the medical profession, journalists, politicians, and high-profile institutions like the World Health, World Health Organization, who? To put things in perspective, let us not forget that pandemics are not rare events. Right after the First World War in 1918, 
the Spanish flu started its green work and in two years only it took uh, between 40 and 50 million human lives. Before the current uh, COVID-19 health crisis, one would be forgiven for thinking that nothing like the Spanish flu would happen again, given our uh, scientific and medical knowledge, and also our uh, economic resources and our powerful communication networks. Well, today that is not so obvious. Despite our resources, we uh, resources that were quite hard to imagine to at the beginning of the 20th century for instance we were unable to prevent the current pandemic uh, if the current death toll is not too green when compa compared with other pandemics that is just because the virus has a relatively low mortality rate and uh, the right number will take some time to settle precisely but so far it seems that about three to four percent of people who co contract the virus die. It is a relatively safe prediction that millions of human lives would be lost by now if the COVID-19 virus had a worse mortality rate. And, is, and it is all, almost a mathematical certainty that in a few decades another more deadly virus will appear. What can we learn from the disastrous a worldwide reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic that might help humanity in the future. Well, the general, general issue here, as far as I can see, is uh, the most basic issue here is epistemic responsibility. In this case, trying hard to figure out the relevant facts about the virus, uh, the virus and uh, its means and rate of contamination and deciding on a set of effective measures to contain the virus. This, however, is not enough by itself. The whole issue is that public life does not work as a scientific inquiry. Public life is not like a detached and careful inquiry uh, as objective as possible. It is rather frivolous entertainment, actually. It's like a game. All that matters is which political tribe gets to score another point. Public communication, as it is right now, uh, is epistemically toxic. It is designed not to allow the careful sifting of evidence, but rather to feed to the public all the gore of political battles, uh, much like medieval beheadings and hangings. Thus, when we need wise political decisions, they are not forthcoming. Why would they? It is like trying to do hard mathematical calculations in a bar. The environment is just not adequate at all. Humans are not able to reason appropriately in that kind of environment. There is a reason why libraries are not like bars. And it is because parliaments and television talk shows are like bars that wise political decisions decisions are not forthcoming in general. Now, imagine that decisions regarding the right ways to perform surgical operations were publicly discussed and politically determined. It seems a safe bet that people would die every day from such surgical operations because no sane procedures would ever be established. Whenever an issue becomes a public issue and politics gets in the way, things tend to get ugly. The political and public institutions we inherited from our predecessors uh, are the result of several hard-won experiences about the way humans behave politically towards one another. We need the division of powers, for instance, because for every benevolent and wise dictatorship, countless others were simply homicidal. We need regular elections to cut short the bad effects of the worst political leaders. The current pandemic seems to suggest that we need to rethink our institutions and to redesign our laws so that wise decisions that save human lives can go through without the interference of bad political actors. The World Health Organization, for instance, should be given a strict technical and scientific code of conduct and it should be completely free from political interference. It should at the same time have the power to enforce its decisions. 
As to the media, we need to rethink the way it operates. We need certainly journalism, but journalism is right now part of the problem, given the way journalism is financed and given the unclear difference between virtuous journalism and frivolous entertainment. Imagine that scientific journals were to be financed just like the New York Times is, via advertising. It is a safe prediction that scientific journals would simply stop being scientific and would instead become frivolous and populist. But why is that? Well, because they would need a very wide readership to finance themselves. So we need to take journalism seriously, just like we take medical research. And the first obvious thing that needs to change is the way journalism is financed. Furthermore, even free speech, as we have it today, needs to be carefully re-examined. Given that so many people are epistemically vicious instead of virtuous, the power they now have to influence others and spread their lies and false beliefs is a very serious business indeed. We have to think about ways to restrict free speech drastically, and one way to do it is for anyone to be able to sue anyone else for the conscious dissemination of disinformation. Let us not forget that it is uneducated that are mostly negatively affected by the dissemination of scientifically false claims. I will not believe another ignorant claiming in the internet that the native Indians here in Brazil have a special root that eaten twice a day cures just about every disease there is, including, of course, cancer. I will not believe that. Unfortunately, many uneducated people will indeed believe those claims because from their epistemic standpoint, those are just claims as plausible as the medical and scientific claims. And that's what worries me. Well, I know I have already voiced a few very, very disturbing ideas and very uh, strange ideas, but I still need to address an issue that hangs over all this discussion, I believe. And uh, uh, Professor Ernesto Perini already uh, uh, mentioned a few of those uh, factors, but the, the main question to ask here is why is it that humans when running unchecked, so to speak, are or tend to be epistemically vicious. Why does that happen? Well, one reason is a uh, widespread disease. People are hypersocial and they want to have a reputation and they want to have a reputation as uh, intelligent and informed people. So that is one reason why toxic disinformation is toxic in the first place. When someone invents some new lie regarding a miracle cure, why does that lie spread so fast? Well, because the first person that heard it was utterly surprised and humbled by it. And now that very person does not want to waste the good opportunity to tell the same lie to someone else and does look intelligent and informed. Rinse and repeats, and here you have it. I mean, humans are, so to speak, epistemically fallen creatures that uh, need to be saved, if you pardon my biblical parlance. Uh, epistemic responsibility may not be the salvation, the salvation we need, but uh, it sure is a step in the right direction, I believe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Great talk. And, uh, <clears throat> okay, so now, um, now I, I'm I'm going to read some questions from the audience on YouTube chat. Uh, we have a lot of questions here, and uh, not much time left. We we go until nine thirty at night. So I hope you understand. We 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 don't read your question. Before this. I have a question sent from Brazil Effective Altruism Group. Uh, they also enjoyed the opportunity to send Professor Singer hug and ask and ask me to think for his work. Uh, to thank for his work. It's a it's a general question, so you all feel free to comment on that. Now uh, I will ask Vitor to put the yeah okay it's it. So 
how should we behave when we need to make political decisions on issues that do not yet have enough scientific data? Uh, I will follow the, the sequence from before, so Professor Singer uh, could start and then Ernesto and Desiderio, if you want, of course. You, you need to unmute Adam. yourself now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so no, you okay. uh, thank you very much for the question. And I'll send greetings back to the uh, Effective Altruism Group uh, in Brazil. It's nice to hear from you. Um, so I, for me, uh, the uh, question of making decisions in uncertainties is the standard uh, probability gamble, that what we have to do is put numbers on the benefits uh, and costs of the various decisions and then uh, discount those benefits and costs by the probabilities that they will be achieved. So uh, that means that if we're facing a situation, to take this back to the pandemic, where uh, if we don't act, uh, the probability, let's say it's a 50% probability, is that there will be um, a thousand extra lives lost. Uh, and if we do act, um, then there will be some cost, but let's say, for, uh, just for argument's sake, that the cost might be that there are uh, 50 lives lost um, because of uh, people not getting their cancer screening done or something like that. Well, um, obviously, if we have a 50% chance of losing 1,000 lives rather than 50, then uh, you know that's going to outweigh it. I, I'm assuming there's a certainty of 50 lives, but a 50% chance of 1,000 lost. So we we discount the 1,000 by 50%, we still get 500. It's still 10 times uh, uh, worse than um, the certainty of losing 50 lives. Now, I, I accept that that's actually very uh, a difficult decision to do because if you really are certain that there's going to be 50 lives lost, people will blame you for those 50 lives and they will say, oh, but we might not have lost any lives. Um, so, you know, we're not very good at taking these risks but still, it seems to me that that's the only rational way to do it. And provided we have, you know, can put numbers on both the costs and benefits and on the risks, then in the long run, we're going to save more lives that way. Okay, thanks. And Nessu, you would like to comment? Yes, I'll be very brief. I think uh, it's not always possible to put numbers, as Professor Singh has mentioned. I think I'll have another take on this issue. I think the main, the one important point is that you have to not to give up on scientific knowledge, even with its uncertainties, and you have to explain to people that there are uncertainties, and we have to we'll try things that may not work, and that doesn't mean that we will take another. That's not being had. That's not indicated by scientific knowledge. So I think we have to inform public that uh, we were dealing with certain uh, issues that may not work. And uh, so th that's the main point, I think, in the public sphere. And that means have, it, have both, as Desiderio said, a more, uh, a more healthier uh, uh, informational uh, uh, environment on the one hand, but also I think it's our, two, two other things are very important. I think have a good educational system that allow people to understand uh, uh, how science works or how knowledge works in, in, in general on the one hand, and also allow the society to have more trusting relations, uh, in institutional relations, that, and that, that, that's, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. I would like just to, uh, uh, to point out that knowledge is weaponized uh, in many social contexts. And what I mean by that is that if I belong to a certain tribe A and you belong to a certain tribe B, and you make, you know, a very scientifically sound prediction, and of course it fails because that's the nature of scientific uh, theories and predictions, it sometimes fails. And then I, I weaponize that to just argue against science in general and to argue against your political tribe in general. And I, I suppose that uh, people must be uh, informed that that's the wrong way to go about it. I mean, we should, the, the, the way knowledge and uh, scientific hypotheses and theories tend to be weaponized politically uh, shouldn't be uh, allowed, shouldn't be taken lightly. 
that's a no-go area. If we do that, it's the trust that we need uh, in order to have knowledge, socially distributed knowledge, the trust just uh, goes away. Uh, it doesn't work uh, if we uh, weaponize knowledge in, in that way. So that's my, my comment on that. Thank you. Uh, so now, so now I'm going to read three questions. So we have a block of three questions since each, each for one of you guys. And then uh, I read the three, uh, and then you, you answer. You, of course, you can comment on, on the different questions. Uh, just uh, so, Vito, can, can you put out the, the first one on the screen? Okay. So the, the first one is for Professor Singer. Considering that speciesism and the pandemic have a close connection, why is the problem omitted by the academic community? And, uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, maybe maybe I should read the second one. Vito, uh, please. The question for Perini: How how can we adjust our epistemic environment in a social media society with an excess of information? And then Vito, uh, the third for Desiderio: Is there a possible way to separate political opinions from environmental? health and other areas, Does, doesn't this involve scientific information but also public politics? So, uh, Vito, uh, put on the screen uh, the, the first question, a uh, primeira questão, Vito. So, okay, go, go ahead, Professor Singer. Thank you, thank you. Well, we've, we've uh, just heard uh, uh, two interesting presentations about uh, uh, knowledge and, and rationality and the various factors, both uh, political and, and personal, uh, that give lead us to take uh, particular takes on, on both what we believe we know and also what we give priority to, what we take as the most important. And I think this question about why the link between speciesism and the pandemic is largely omitted by the academic community um, can be answered in, in the terms of uh, what my co-speakers have been saying. Um, most of the academic community continues to eat meat and continues to uh, seek to justify that by uh, downplaying, discounting or uh, ignoring the interests of non-human animals. So uh, given that, to uh, accept and focus on the role that speciesism has played in giving rise to the pandemic would lead to uh, some cognitive dissonance, uh, let's put it that way, to some sense that, uh, oh, well, maybe I should be changing my own eating habits in order to uh, not be complicit in these species as practices that have even not only had bad consequences for animals, but have even had disastrous consequences for humans. Uh, and so I think that's the reason why people tend to look away, not focus at that, or perhaps they say, well, nothing can be done about that. We'll somehow have to cope with uh, the, the risk and just take measures to try to reduce the impact of pandemics to get vaccines and so on um, so that we don't have to really deal with the uh, the root cause that is at the foundation of uh, why we have had this pandemic and why we had also as i said the previous uh, pandemics and why quite likely we'll have future pandemics okay thanks so now ernesto uh you want to answer Arthur's question? Okay. Um, I think the, the mo I think we have to 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 have more clear epistemic filters on, on different sorts of information so that people can read uh, what comes from where and and what can be trusted or not. Uh, but that has two two sides. On the one hand, uh, may I, I I don't quite believe in centralized uh, uh, regulations for, for the way information uh, spread in the internet. I don't think, of course, there should be some regulation, but uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's not going to be enough. So I think on the one hand, people have to, to, to trust more and to know more about what sorts of institutions embody, embody knowledge and what can, what can be trusted or not and what subjects. 
So we have to build more trusting relations. And there are some factors that contribute to that. Uh, for instance, uh, there, there are a couple of economists that, ha that have shown that unequal uh, societies are much less trusting than less unequal societies. So this is a way to build more trusting relations. And, and so to trust more uh, institutions that uh, represent knowledge. So we have, to, on the one hand, more, have more clear filters, at least as far as scientific knowledge is concerned, but comes from where, and people have to be more willing to read those, those, those signs of, of knowledge. But as a matter of fact, I don't know how to adjust our epistemic environment. I think I, I, I think you just have to to trust more and to know more and to have more clear filters of different sorts of information so that people can can read it. But I'm not sure that's going to work. I don't have a suggestion on that. I just have an idea of why it doesn't work, <laughs> not why how how end it. That that's it. Okay, so. Now the question for Professor Desiderio, Vitor, the, the next one. Okay. Uh, well, uh, if, uh, if you look at most uh, political debates, most public political debates, uh, most questions are empirical and not uh, philosophical or questions of principle. I know that sometimes people tend to say, well, those are my values and it's just a question of principle. But that's, uh, well, I would like to see a study about it. But uh, my experience is that most of the time people are just arguing about empirical matters. And so uh, I do realize that there are uh, in some cases, uh, uh, instances where uh, the disagreement is not about facts, but it's about values or what it is that you value most and what it is that I value most. Uh, but that doesn't, I, I don't think that that is the, the, the general rule. Uh, I think that the general rule is more like people uh, are arguing about empirical matters from uh, sitting on a chair. I mean, without checking the facts, they are arguing about facts. And arguing about facts is just nonsensical to me. I mean, if you are discussing facts, you have to uh, look at evidence and uh, scientific experiments and so on. That's not the sort of thing that you can determine by just by uh, standing still on a chair. Um, but but sure, but there are some. Uh, uh, but at the end of the day, you, you reach a point where perhaps you you will find some disagreement about uh, pure values, so to speak. I would doubt about it. I would doubt it very much because I I, I believe that uh, anyone would agree that we should strive to do the best to promote. Uh, human flourishing and what it is that promotes human flourishing is an empirical question uh, it's not the sort of thing that you can discover by sitting on a chair like a philosopher so i would say that uh, 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 the so-called political opinions people have on uh, issues that are actually uh, uh, scientific or empirical questions are just a way to disguise the discussion somewhat and uh, uh, push the discussion uh, into a, uh, uh, a wrong direction in the sense that if we want to really discuss, for instance, uh, uh, environmental issues, well, I am unable to do that because I'm not an expert on that area. And people want to discuss those issues, even if they don't know mostly, well, almost anything about those areas. They just have some general political stances about, say, uh, uh, environmental issues. And that's just nonsensical. It's not rational to do that kind of thing, I suppose. Okay, thanks. So now let's 
put the next question on screen. It's for Professor Singer. Do you think that the vegan way of life can be strengthened by the fact that our crisis start with the ingestions of animal meat? Is it opportune to combine COVID prevent an animal case? Uh, so I'm not sure that uh, this ex exactly boosts a vegan way of life, uh, but it certainly boosts a uh, criticism of the two sources of, of pandemics that we have experienced in recent decades, one of which is the uh, wet markets, uh, as they're called, the markets at which live animals are uh, uh, exhibited at the market and then uh, a customer points to an animal in a cage and says, I'll have that one, and the animal is then slaughtered on the spot in the market. Um, these markets, um, particularly, of course, we're focusing on the one in Wuhan, where it appears that the pandemic originated. Uh, there are many different species of wild animals that are brought, that are brought there, that are sold. Um, they, they're crowded together. They're stressed in cages. Uh, Basically, they're, they're shitting over each other in these cages and on the floor. And then, of course, when they're killed, the, their blood is running around as well. So uh, they're very unhygienic places and they're ideal places for spreading uh, viruses. And I think there's no doubt that that should not be permitted uh, for the benefit of the health of the whole world, as we've seen in this case. But that's only going to affect a small number of people. The bigger issue is factory farming, which has been shown to uh, breed these viruses. And uh, I think it, the, uh, the fact that our, the crisis uh, of 2009, the pandemic started with factory farming and that it's uh, a lot of experts have warned that factory farming is an ideal place for breeding new viruses should lead to a reconsideration of factory farming. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's going to happen because the vested interests in these large uh, industrial farms is huge. And of course, they're going to wage a campaign uh, to, against any uh, attack on their ability to profit from exploiting animals in this way. And they will appeal to the public and say, your, your meat will become more expensive if we don't have factory farms, which no doubt is true. Um, so it's, it's going to be very difficult to stop factory farming. But um, if we were ideally rational, and of course we've had uh, suggestions into this in this very uh, session as to uh, that, that we're not ideally rational, if, but if we were, then I think we would get rid of factory farming. We might still have some forms of farming which are more traditional, which have not been shown to produce uh, viruses, new viruses in the same way that factory farms do. So that's why I hesitate to say that this is, uh, should lead to a specifically fully vegan way of life, but it should lead to uh, a, a greatly reduced consumption of animal products, uh, which as I said earlier, makes sense in terms of climate change, makes sense in terms of reducing cruelty. And uh, many experts, for example, recent reports in The Lancet uh, show also makes sense from a personal health perspective. Okay, thank you, Singer. So if if you guys want to comment on that, we have some other questions for you, but yeah, okay. Uh, the next one is for Professor Desideo. How, how can we handle at the same time epistemic responsibility, social network with fake news and pandemic of COVID-19? Uh, well, this, thank you very much for this question. This uh, allows me to go back to a, a previous question uh, to Professor Perini that I wanted to comment on and then I, I forgot. Uh, because I, I, I think that the, we have to learn scientifically uh, what works in order to make people uh, be more uh, epistemic responsible. It's not the sort of thing that you can solve philosophically from your chair. Uh, we have to run uh, socially, uh, uh, we have to take seriously uh, uh, scientific sociology and uh, psychology, and we have to uh, uh, do empirical studies on people to, uh, to discover what are the right incentives and disincentives to make people be more uh, epistemically responsible. And not only regarding individual uh, persons, 
but also institutions. We have to learn scientifically how to design institutions such that they will be resilient to uh, political uh, push and uh, uh, influences, negative influences, uh, so that those uh, institutions are, are well designed enough so that they promote epistemic responsibility and even when they fail they are able to uh, regroup themselves so to speak so that they uh, are uh, 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 they earn our uh, def epistemic deference uh, which is what we need to uh, uh, to have a, uh, a healthy uh, epistemic uh, society so my my answer to you just like the answer to the previous question to professor perini is that uh, philosophers have a have the tools to, you know, locate the problem and try to clear the issues. But the real uh, uh, deal here is scientific, is empirical. We have to learn scientifically, empirically, with sociology and with psychology, uh, what are the right incentives and disincentives to make people. Uh, be more uh, epistemically responsible, and not only people, individual persons, but also uh, institutions themselves. That's not the sort of thing that you can uh, figure out just by thinking alone. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, as I said before, if you want, you can comment on the, each other's question. Oh, I, I have a comment on that. and. Uh, I, I, I think I partially agree with uh, what Professor Zdero Mosho has said, but at the same time, I'm a bit skeptical about the, the, the power of nudges and incentives to change people's behavior in a significant way. Uh, there is the work of two economists, uh, Wilkerson and Pickett. They have two books, the inner level and the spirit level, in which they show that uh, the, trust in, the, trust, the trust in a society varies inversely to, to inequality in, this, in that society. So I think there are reasons to think that, and, and, and I think that nudges won't be enough and the designing um, uh, design institutions and communication, scientific communication won't, won't be enough to, to build trusting relations among people in a very trust, in a very unequal society. And that's what they show. And they show empirically that uh, unequal societies, unequal societies are very, have very, uh, the trust, the, the trust is much, uh, are much uh, uh, to significant levels lesser than uh, less unequal societies, and in this respect, the Brazil has the a very low level of trust in any in the world, and it's a very unequal society. So this is the first, the first remark. That doesn't mean that nudges are not uh, incentives are not are not uh, good, but I don't think they will be enough to solve the problem. Uh, so that, that's so. Uh, the result is that the way. Uh, the second comment is that uh, I, I mentioned uh, Dan Cahan, and uh, he's shown uh, uh, with uh, others uh, researchers that, uh, at least as far as climate uh, change is concerned, the acceptance of scientific uh, results doesn't vary with the education of a person, but with the political position uh, the person has. So. The more, very broadly saying, the more right-wing the person is, independent of the education uh, the person has, uh, the less uh, she will be inclined to to uh, to accept the scientific conclusions about climate change. And this goes for every subject having a political uh, mark. So I don't think it varies only, and as a matter of fact, I don't think it varies mainly with education of a person. But at least for some subjects, it depends on the political position the person has. Uh, and this has been shown empirically again by Dan Cahan and Stefan Lewandowski and other, and other researchers. That's it. Thanks, Ernesto. So, uh, Vito, can you put out the next question? Okay. So, this is from Iris Almeida. And, uh, okay, I'm going to read it in two slides. Okay. So, I have a question. Epistemic irresponsibility is a social and political issue. It has been suggested that one way to tackle this is to strengthen the, the robustness of the institution that produce and disseminate scientific information. 
Doesn't this reinforcement point towards a kind of political epistocracy? Well, I mean, it's a it's a question for for all of you. It's a general question. I, I believe you you could. Uh, uh, Professor Singer uh, wants to, want to start. To uh, I, I feel that this question is is more for uh, for for you who, who spoke more about uh, the epistemic issues. Um, uh, the the, the I, I'm just will comment on the phrase uh, political epistocracy. Um, I'm not sure what if this is supposed to suggest something like uh, Plato's uh, philosopher kings, perhaps. Um, but if what we're talking about is the idea that some people have more expertise in scientific fields than others, and if that is supposed to be an epistocracy, and if that term is supposed to suggest that there's something bad about it, you know, it's like aristocracies where if you're of noble birth, you rule over people who are not of noble birth, and you know, we all think that that's bad nowadays. But I don't think there's anything wrong with an epistocracy in the sense of recognizing that there are some people who are more expertise in areas of science and medicine and climate change and, and so on than, than other people who are simply not scientifically qualified in those areas. Now, um, should they rule? Well, not directly. But uh, to, to come back to the lockdown that I mentioned earlier that we have had in uh, Melbourne uh, for a, a long time, some people did notice that the chief medical officer of the state, uh, who was appearing regularly at press conferences alongside the state's premier, uh, the politi political leader of the state, um, uh, was having a lot of influence. Um, uh, and But I think that was a good thing that the premier was listening to the chief medical officer who knew a lot about um, the what, what you had to do in order to reduce transmission of, of the virus. Um, so, you know, was he therefore effectively uh, an epistocracy uh, running the state for this period? Well, um, if the political leaders think that the, the most important thing to do at this particular time is to stop the infection spreading, um, then I suppose he was. Uh, but that in itself is not a bad thing. It, it would, of course, be a bad thing if somehow that continued, uh, his authority continued when this was no longer such a central issue for for the state and for the people in the state. Um, but uh, you know, given that you have a, a robust political system, that's not going to happen. The uh, elected uh, leaders will respond to people's uh, desire not to be in long-term lockdown, and once it gets reasonable to relax that, then it gets relaxed. So uh, I'm I'm not so worried about scientists uh, forming a political epistocracy as is perhaps suggested by the question. Well, I think I, I basically agree with Professor Singer. I have I will add two 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 or three comments. The first comment is that um, we do trust on on experts on many issues. It's not something new. If you if you have a, a new nurse, you go to a doctor. If you want to build a house, you, you hire an engineer. If I have a doubt concerning, uh, say, uh, concerning, concerning why there are more hurricanes or whatever, you talk to a scientist as well. So we do that in many, many, many cases. It's not something new. It's not something unusual. It's something that could do currently. But I think there are two issues that you have to, to think uh, with that. The first issue is that there is a linguist uh, called uh, Nick Enfield uh, who, who is thinking about those uh, those things and he says that scientists have also to be good storytellers and I think we have to connect emotionally with science and that's that's that that means that people have to feel that they are connected with what science says and with uh, theories and they have to say that they to feel that they belong to communities that produce such knowledge not, uh, they have to recognize themselves in this knowledge produced in, in society and, and in universities and research institutes. So this is one thing. And the second thing is that there is not a general answer in different subjects. There will be different experts and they will be sensitive, they will be sensitive to different demands of the society. So it's not like putting one person or one group of persons uh, 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 on the top of the, of the society deciding on any issue but on different issues, uh, being sensitive to different demands of the society, you listen to, 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 to the expertise that they have, 
but I think this is a good thing. Well, I, I I would say that we already have, in a sense, uh, a political idiosocracy in the sense that there are several uh, 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 people that have specialized knowledge and they have power to interfere with one another's life uh, lives. Uh, uh, teachers, for instance, they have the power to make or break a student. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, your doctor has the power to uh, uh, ask you uh, to do some uh, surgical uh, uh, operation, for instance. Uh, but the real issue here, I, I suppose, is that we are uh, almost, uh, you know, at least people who are historically aware, we are afraid of a certain sort of Plato's uh, sort of dictatorship of the philosopher king or something. So when someone talks about uh, political epistocracy like uh, Jason Brennan, people, uh, uh, I mean, the red light goes up and people are immediately uh, very afraid of that. But I suppose that the right, uh, that, that in a, in a in a very technological and scientifically based society and uh, in a very complex society like our own, I would say that uh, walking in that direction is inevitable. We, we depend on very uh, complex knowledge and very specialized knowledge, so we depend on those um, specialists. We just have to make sure that we design our institutions and our uh, laws in such a way that no one uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, special person or group of persons or institution will have the power to uh, terrorize people and exploit people and do uh, things like that. So we have to strike a balance here between the dangers of political epistocracy in the sense of a sort of Plato's philosopher king dictatorship and what we have right now which is well we, you have scientific consensus about something and then uh, because that doesn't sound right for your political beliefs you start rioting and screaming and putting videos on the internet and all that and we're just doing incredibly uh, silly things that will in the long run and even not in the long run in the short run will damage and, and make many people suffer needlessly so we have to strike a balance there so that we have uh, political expertise that's uh, sensitive to scientific expertise and we have to have trust in those institutions and those parties Okay, thank you, this day. So I promised Singer that I would finish this at 9.30. But we have one last question, maybe. it's uh, We have time enough at least to, to announce this question. Is that okay for you? Yes, sure. We can take one last question. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, Vito, can you, can you put the last one on there? Okay, so... What would you think about using cognitive bias against fake news and science denialism? Yeah, it's a question for all of you again, and uh, you feel free to comment on this. Yes, I, I would like to hear this time first from my colleagues who I think have thought more about bias is being envisaged well, here. Um, okay. Uh, oh, well, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, that's what nudges do. I mean, to use our cognitive bias to induce a certain behavior in people. That's what this nudge, nudges strategies do. And I think it has some, some effectiveness, but I think it doesn't solve the problem, uh, as I've said. Because when you have so much hatred in a society and when you have so much distrust, it's very difficult to build back relations in, in, trust, in trusting relations uh, using uh, strategies that will appeal to our cognitive biases. Uh, this said, I think we have to understand the way we think about the subjects so as to induce different kinds of response that will maybe 
that will maybe uh, lead us to a more uh, uh, rational uh, approach to information. Uh, this said, uh, both fake news and science denialism are, uh, exploit our cognitive biases, uh, sometimes in a centralized way, but I think mostly as the simple effect of the way information is spread to the internet with no one being really responsible for, the, for what happens. It's just the effect of the way it goes. And, and it's, it's a bit, so it's not that they use it, they, they meet the cognitive biases and lead in a certain direction. Well, I, I would like to point out that one of the reasons that uh, Professor Peter Singers has been and continues to be such a, an inspiration for so many of us is that, uh, for instance, in his take on very, very difficult ethical issues involving uh, non-human non animals or abortion or euthanasia, uh, he always took the uh, very... Uh, uh, rational stance and he never appealed to our uh, cognitive biases and it would be easier perhaps uh, perhaps it's easier if you want to convince someone that eating meat is uh, well immoral or it's the wrong thing to do perhaps it's easier for you to appeal to emotion and to you know to strike uh, those emotions that makes people feel bad and, uh, well, I wouldn't, I, I don't believe that works quite well. If you strike those, uh, if you ring those bells, if you try to influence people's behavior based on their cognitive biases, then someone else will use the same cognitive biases in another direction. So you have to tell people the reason why things are the way they are and try to reason with them carefully and not exploiting them, not trying to somehow uh, uh, con them. Uh, a, a related issue here is trust. I mean, there's one reason why I trust Professor Peter Singer's writings. He earned my trust over the years because he's clear, his writing is so clear, he's so rational, he's so uh, trying to present the evidence and the arguments clearly so that I can decide for myself. That earns uh, uh, trust. So if he instead tried to con me into his positions by, by you know, language games and things like that, he wouldn't have my trust at all. So I don't think that's a good strategy to use people's cognitive biases, you know, to nudge them in the right direction. I, I, I don't suppose that's a very good strategy. Well, thank you very much for those uh, kind words. And um, I think you're right. I think uh, in, in the long run, we, we don't want to reinforce cognitive biases that are contrary to a, a rational approach. Um, uh, and, and that is what I've tried to do in my writing and uh, uh, I, it, it certainly has worked to some extent. Um, maybe you could get short-term gains, gains by being more emotional, but I think uh, in the long run, you probably lose that. So thank you guys for your time and uh, patience and uh, in, in the name of the organization of this meeting, uh, hope everyone enjoyed this. Uh, have a good day, Peter Singer. Have a good night, everyone else. So, good. bye bye. Thank you very much, and thank, thank you. you for all those who asked questions as well. I appreciated that. Thank you very much. It was yeah. a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Good. bye, -bye. Yeah.